service. We're glad you tuned in this morning. I'd like to read for you a quote from C.S. Lewis who said, The fact that our heart yearns for something earth cannot supply is proof that heaven is our home. We've come today to worship the living God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's now prepare our hearts to do so.
Lately in our Confessions of Faith, we have been talking about who Jesus is. A good summary of the person and work of Christ is found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 8. For those of you who are not familiar with the Westminster Confession, it's uh, a document that's been one of the most influential ever written in the English language. And so we'll look at that this morning. It pleased God in His eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, His only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, the head and savior of His church, the heir of all things and judge of the world, unto whom He did from all eternity give a people to be His seed and to be by Him redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Amen. God has sanctified us. He's set us apart to make us different, make us holy, to make us live more and more in conformity to His will. But if you, if you look at our lives, it often seems like we've fallen off course, that we've run off the tracks. And so it's important that we come on a regular basis confessing our sin to Him and our need for forgiveness. We'll do so now, first silently, and then together using the prayer that's on your screen. Let us now humbly confess our sins before God. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful in good, and all our shortcomings and offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. O Lord, have mercy upon us who are ashamed and sorry for all we've done to displease you. Teach us to hate our errors, cleanse us from our secret faults, and forgive our sins for the sake of your dear Son. Send your purifying grace into our hearts, that we may live in your light and walk in your ways, according to the commandments of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear now the good news of the gospel. From Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. Let us now sing. Thank you. 
the crazy months of the pandemic. If you'd like to continue doing so, you can give online at southsidepca.org. Or you can also mail a check into our physical office, and that address is on the screen in front of you. This morning for our scripture reading, we will read Isaiah chapter 40. Starting next week, the first week of Advent, we will begin reading through the book of Luke. And this week we're doing a, a chapter of preparation for that, Isaiah chapter 40. So let's now turn our attention to God's holy word, beginning at verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O oh, Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of, Jeru of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with the young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him? the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare him with? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and casts it for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, 
by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Think about the privilege we have of coming before this almighty God with our prayers and concerns. He calls us to come into his presence. He says we have not because we ask not. So let's now turn to the Lord in prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You made the heavens and the earth by your great power and with your outstretched arm, your invisible attributes, your eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen through what you have made. And the heavens declare your glory. You are the creator and sustainer of all things, and in you all things hold together. In you we live and move and have our being. But far too often we seek out to live as if you don't exist. And so we humbly come confessing our sense of autonomy before you, our rebellion before you. We seek your forgiveness and your help so that we can live in a way that glorifies you in everything we do, in everything we think, in everything we say. You tell us to bring our requests before you, and so we do so. We pray for our troubled country, and we pray for our national leaders in Washington, that you would give them great wisdom during this time. We pray for our state leaders uh, in Austin, for Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Attorney General Ken Paxton. We pray for our local leaders like our Mayor Joe McComb and our city council members and our city manager Peter Zanoni and our county judge Barbara Canales. You have raised them up to lead us and so we pray that they would lead us in a way that pleases you. Father, we thank you for the life of Lloyd Ramey and we pray that you would comfort his friends and his family as they mourn his loss. We thank you for the great joy he brought many of us here at Southside and many in Corpus Christi. And we thank you that he died in faith, a man who trusted you for his salvation. And we thank you that you let us know him for his many years on this earth. We also want to pray uh, for the Arvin family and for Becky Arvin's mom, Betty, whose older sister Mavis just passed away. We pray that uh, Betty would be comforted by her daughter Becky in the midst of this and that, that you would give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray for Bob Beeland, who has suffered a stroke, and we pray that the rehab he goes through will, uh, will help him uh, get back to full health. And so we, we pray for him. We thank you for Tina for her being so strong throughout this trial, and we ask your blessings on them. We pray for Don Flint and others who are battling cancer, that their treatments would be successful. We pray for Terry Clark's aunt, Judy, who's in the hospital with high blood pressure and uh, high heart rate, and we ask that you would uh, give the doctors wisdom on how to, to bring that under control. We also pray for George Munoz, who lost his aunt in Laredo recently, Pray for George and his family that you would use him as an instrument of your grace to give them peace and comfort. We also pray for others who have lost loved ones. We pray for Elsie and Pat. We pray for the Martin family, for Larry and Melody and Dennis, Carly and Ashley. And we pray that you would remind them that you are a good and loving God even though you lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. 
Remind us that you are taking us to the, the land of green pastures. Father, we also pray for the Markhams as they deal with their issues. Various issues without Joe's help and comfort them and give them wisdom. We thank you for the new birth of Naomi Grace Fast. And we thank you for Steve and Rachel for bringing their family to us from Japan. We also pray for our expected moms, for Meredith and Tiffany and Lorena and Carly, that you would keep them safe and give them healthy deliveries and healthy children. We also pray for Kathy Robinson's sister Linda, who is in the Mayo Clinic. We pray that you would give the doctors there uh, wisdom on how to treat her recurring tumors. And we pray for Jefferson and all the logistical issues involved with his kidney transplant. Father, we thank you for Yuki and all of her wonderful work in Japan. Pray that you would bring her back to full health soon and bless all those that she ministers to. Thank you most of all for Jesus and for the gospel. We pray all these things in his holy name. Amen. As we prepare to hear from his word, let's now sing to our holy God. Please join me now in Proverbs chapter 19. Last week we looked at the first half of this chapter, so today we'll look at verses 13 through 29. Let's turn our attention to God's Word. 
A foolish son is ruin to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. House and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Slothfulness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. Whoever keeps the commandment keeps his life. He who despises his ways will die. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. A man of great wrath will pay the penalty for you if you deliver him. You will only have it to do again. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. What is desired in a man is steadfast love, and a poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Strike a scoffer, and the simple will learn prudence. Reprove a man of understanding, and he will gain knowledge. He who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A worthless witness mocks at justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Condemnation is ready for scoffers and beating for the backs of fools. This is God's word. Let's look to him together in prayer. Our Father and our King, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you for preserving these words so that we can learn more about how to please you and how to live in harmony with one another and in harmony with this world. We pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Earlier this week, our church uh, suffered a, a loss of a, a beloved brother, Lloyd Ramey. Major Ramey lived to be 96 years old and was a friend to many of us in our congregation here. And it's a reminder that death is real, that we are not promised a long life. Major Ramey lived a lot longer than most of us will, but even he was ready for death he was looking forward to being back with Margie again in heaven, and now he's in glory with the king. And when we think about death and the finality of what it means, it, it puts the word of God into very strong uh, opinions, very strong contrast with the philosophies of the, of the world that passes away. So this morning, what I want to do is Look closely at one verse, verse 16, and then expand to the rest of these verses in light of what we see in verse 16. So verse 16 says this, Whoever keeps the commandments keeps his life, and he who despises his ways will die. This verse is a warning. It's a warning to us. It's similar to what we see in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. I want to read that section for you, and you'll, you'll see the, the similarities there. King David writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward." So God has not left us wandering through this dark, fallen world with no guidelines. He's given us his holy word to instruct us how to navigate 
through these dark waters. And so in this, these verses in Psalm 19, these verses 7 through 11, uh, the Word of God is described in many ways. It's given five titles in these verses. In verse 7 of Psalm 19, we see it's called the law, and God's Word is also called the testimony. In verse 8, it's called our precepts and commandments. And verse 9, it's called the rules. So this Word of God is given titles. It's also given qualities in these verses. In verse 7, it's called perfect and sure. In verse 8, it's called right and pure. In verse 9, it's called clean, enduring, true, and righteous. In verse 10, it's called desirable and sweet. And there are four results of God's word that King David gives us in Psalm 19. In verse 7, he says it revives the soul. In verse 8, it says it makes wise the simple. Uh, David uses the term simple like Solomon does. It's people who are wishy-washy, non-committed. They'll believe anything. But verse 8 says it makes these simple people wise. In verse 9, it rejoices the heart. And in verse 10, the word of God enlightens the eyes. So what's King David's takeaway in Psalm 19 as he thinks about God's word? Well, it's, it's great on the one hand, but in verse 11, he says, By them your servant is warned, to whom much is given, much is demanded. And God gives us his word to guide us through life. And there are wonderful blessings for those who trust in God and trust in his word. In verse 11, it says, In keeping them there is great reward. But on the other hand, we ignore them at our own peril. And so King David, looking at God's words, says this is a great reward on the one hand, but a warning to those who ignore it on the other. So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 19. And look at what Solomon says in verse 16. Whoever keeps the commandment keeps his life. He who despises his ways will die. Now, verse 16 is similar to a, a play on words we saw in the early chapters of Proverbs with the Hebrew word, which means to keep. And remember, when that word, that verb is used to keep, when it refers to laws or commandments, it means to heartily obey. But when that verb keep is used in reference to people and lives, it means to guard and protect. So we see a play on words here that... Keeping the commandment leads to keeping our lives, protecting our lives. Again, it, it's what King David is saying in Psalm 19. To obey God's word brings great sweetness to life and great rewards. But there's a warning towards those who ignore it. In this verse in Hebrew, in uh, verse 16... The, the first part is just four words. It uses the participle form, meaning keeping commandments, keeping life. It's that clear. Keeping commandments, keeping life. Are we striving to keep God's commandments? Are we striving to keep His holy law? To glorify Him, to please Him, but also to guard our own lives. Walking with God keeps us away from all of the dangers or from wandering off the, the road into the dangerous pitfalls that, that we can destroy ourselves in. And again, to whom much is demanded, uh, to whom much is given, much is demanded. Now, the, the flip side, if we don't keep God's commandments, Solomon says it's like despising our ways, despising our lives. Often when we get advice from people who have been down this road before, they'll say, well, if you know what's good for you, you will do this and you'll stay away from that. And that's what King Solomon, or that's what Solomon is saying to us. If we know what's good for us, if we care about our future, if we care about our lives, we will stay on course with what God 
says to do. Or else we die. We die. We die in several ways. A spiritual death. A spiritual death. Our soul lies under the wrath of God for those who don't know him. And not only does our soul lie under the wrath of God, it is cut off from all communion with God. Many scholars say the the great blessing of being in heaven is being in communion with God. And the great curse of being in hell is being cut off from God and all that is good and all that is beautiful. Being cut off is part of this spiritual death. It's also an eternal death that Solomon is talking about. It torments and anguishes us and it never stops. We get pictures of that on earth. We, we go through excruciating pain, but we know that it will end at some point. But not for eternal death. It won't go away. It's a real death. It's a, it's a real death. It, it's just as real as what Major Ramey experienced in his physical death earlier this week. Now, for him, he trusted the Lord. We, we prayed often together. Uh, every time I left when I was visiting him, we would pray together and pray the Lord's Prayer. The man knew Jesus and is with him in glory now. What about you? Do you have that same confidence that you're ready to die like Major Ramey did? Or do you fear death not knowing what lies ahead for you in the future? The Bible says we can know that we have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Major Ramey did. Do you? Well, how do we, how do we know that? The Bible tells us that all those who trust in Christ alone for their salvation will be saved. That no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we trusting in? What are we taking refuge in? In our own wisdom, like going through life based on what we think is best? Trusting our own goodness, like, I think I'm good enough. I'm not a terrorist. I don't fly planes in the buildings. I don't kill people. I'm nice to dogs. I don't eat dogs. I'm nice to dogs. Is that good enough to get to heaven? Do you even believe there is a heaven? Well, the Bible screams at us. There is. The Bible is God's words to us wandering through this dark, broken world. Here is life. This is what it's all about. There is a heaven and hell, and there are consequences to walking with God, walking in his ways. So this death, it's a spiritual death. It's eternal death. It's a real death. And it's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 23 in Proverbs chapter 19 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. Another recurring theme through Proverbs is fearing the Lord. When we understand the wrath of God, we understand we don't want to go there. It makes us want to please him when we see who he is and what he's done for us. The last thing in the world we'd want to do is displease this God who's done so much for us. And the last thing we want to do personally is to taste his wrath. We want to taste his smile. So verse 16 puts it out there for us. Keep God's law. He will protect us from eternal spiritual death by taking refuge in him. Now, how does this play out in the other passages that we see in this chapter, as we kind of uh, back up and, and look at the other verses around it. In verses 13 and 14, we see a comparison between a, a dysfunctional home and a functional home. A dysfunctional home where a son runs off and spends the inheritance. The wife is quarrelsome and uh, brings not much peace in their home. Compared to a functional home, a Christian home that follows the principles of God. Verse 14, house and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. So the the children are uh, inheriting God's blessing and 
The wife is a blessing to the household, one that follows God's laws. Think about verse 15, when we don't follow God's instructions to work hard and work as unto the Lord, we become lazy and uh, we suffer the consequences. It's a, a biblical principle. Working hard brings good, good fruit. Think about how we love the poor, how we treat the poor in verse 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. So we're called to love those that are in poverty. We're called to love those who are not able to help us in return. Many people say that you can see a man's character by how he treats someone who cannot pay him back, who cannot do anything back for him. Do we treat them with the honor, dignity, and respect? that we should as one who is created in God's image? Or do we only look to our rich friends and treat them with the honor, dignity, and respect because we want to get things back from them? You see, if we follow God's principles and uh, apply it to our lives, it's a blessing to our society as we help the poor, but also God will be faithful to repay us as well. Think about the discipline that we have for our children in verse 18. If we discipline our sons, it, it goes well for them and goes well for our household. But we don't discipline the son. It shows that we don't love them and we're just asking for trouble. Listening to advice, look at verse 20. We follow the advice from God's word or from godly people. And it sends us down the right path. And we gain wisdom. We gain knowledge of who God is and how he works in this world. Or we can ignore it and destroy ourselves. You see, it all comes down to how we look at God's word. Do we look at God's word as wise and instructful and bringing great joy and peace as we follow it? Or do we look at it as just an optional piece of information in this whole world full of other information that battles for our desires and battles for our time. God's word is true. And he calls us to live according to it and to trust him through it. Let's pray that God would help us as we seek to do so. Our Father and our God, we pray that you would convict us of the times where we disregard your teaching. We treat it as merely an option we go days and weeks without ever looking at your word. Father, we pray that you would give us the same high view of Scripture that King David had, who understood the blessing of knowing you and the blessing of walking with you and the consequences of disregarding the wisdom that you give us in your word. So we pray that you would turn our hearts towards you, give us a love and a desire to read your word, to know your word, to meditate on your word, to memorize your word, and to apply it to our lives. And if there's any who are watching who do not know you and do not trust your word, we pray that through your Holy Spirit you would open their hearts and open their eyes so that they would look to you as their Lord and King, not only their Savior, but their King. Help us to see that walking with you brings true joy. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's respond by singing to our great God and King.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Let all God's people shout, Alleluia, Amen. Yeah. All right. Will you make the folder that we just recorded the 22nd? And then the next week's the 29th?